Good morning, sisters and brothers. Welcome to our Thursday evening devotion. I'm Pastor Luther. This is Incarnation Lutheran Church, and we are delighted to have you. I want to invite you to take a look at our website, godamong.us, or go to one of our apps on your iPhone or your smartphone, and check us out. We have all kinds of things on there for you, and it's all there ready for you to help deepen your faith and your spiritual life. So please do check that out. In the past few weeks, I've taken my turn at our evening devotions to speak with you about contemporary theology, and I do that for a couple of very specific reasons. Um, the theological enterprise is sometimes seen as something that's pretty, pretty wooden, that once we've got it and once we've learned it, it never changes. But in my experience, it has to be fluid. It has to change and go with the flow of time because even though God doesn't change, even though God's love for us doesn't change, we do. And the way in which we live in various times and places uh, has a profound impact upon the way in which we interpret what we're doing. Contemporary theologians have recognized that and have gone with the flow and have changed their ideas based upon the things that they see. In the late 19th century, uh, in recognition of the fact that human beings were not seen as really viable or valuable, there was thought that arose about individualism, and it was called liberalism, and, that, and I mean that in the philosophical, not the political sense. The, the notion that human beings, every human being had value in God's eyes and ought to in our eyes as well. And so people like Adolf von Harnack and Albert Britschel began to point out, look how much we've accomplished. It's not about anything that is ethereal or anything strange, but human beings have a capacity to do well, and they wanted to underscore that and did. That notion gave rise to a lot of almost superhuman thinking. Um, and it wasn't until the, the, the advent maybe of, of uh, neo-orthodoxy that people began to think about, through thinkers like Karl Barth and Reinhold Niebuhr, began to think about sinfulness and remind us that, yes, we are capable of doing many things by God's grace, but the fact remains that we sin. Uh, we've spoken about liberation theology and the notion that God cares for those who are oppressed and God pays special attention to liberate those from suffering in this world. We talked about Karl Barth specifically. We talked about Reinhold Niebuhr a little bit. We talked about Jürgen Moltmann. And today, tonight, I want to speak with you about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German-born Lutheran pastor and theologian born um, on at the beginning of, I think, February in 1906. And he was born in Breslau, Germany, to a fairly uh, intellectually um, awakened family. His father was a, a psychiatrist and a, a, a neurologist of some import. His mother was the daughter of a very famous German theologian, and a, uh, I think one of her grandfathers was an artist, a painter that was very well known. So the entirety of Bonhoeffer's life, even though it was large, there was a, it was a pretty big family. Um, all the kids had access to good, solid education. And they were um, one of those families that bore the fruit of the, the wonder that was German culture and society uh, pre-World War I. So they had a lot of gifts. They had a lot of blessings in their family. Um, they were thinkers. They were outspoken thinkers. His father, for example, Karl Bonhoeffer, was a well-known psychiatrist, as I said, whose claim to fame was that he disagreed with Sigmund Freud and pushed back against the very popular notions of Sigmund Freud. Uh, his, his oldest brother, um, Karl, was a chemist. And um, I'm not sure exactly, but he gained some notoriety around the world for explorations and for advancements that he personally made in chemistry. His middle brother died in the First World War. He had sisters who uh, suffered during the midst of the wars. He had other brothers who were executed by the Nazis because of their... One was a, a, a lawyer and was executed for participating in the plot to kill Hitler. Bonhoeffer himself was a person who was a pastor and a theologian that was concerned about the well-being of his people. I want to read a verse to you, only one verse, because of its importance to Bonhoeffer. It talked about call, the call. And it's one of the first verses that he cites in his little book called The Cost of Discipleship, which is of profound importance. 
And if you have an opportunity to read that book, I would highly encourage you to do it because even though it was written in a particular context for a particular time, it speaks to us today. But the verse I want to read to you, perhaps I'll read two verses to you, but it's from Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Mark chapter 2, 13 and 14, particularly verse 14. It's the call of Levi, son of Alphaeus, the tax collector. Um, the call is simple. The response is even simpler. So listen for it. This is Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and I'm going to read from the message translation. Then Jesus went again to walk alongside the lake. Again a crowd came to him, and he taught them. Strolling along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, at his work collecting taxes. Jesus said, come along with me. He came. This, these two verses are, are particularly important because um, there is no mystery in the following of Jesus. There, there is uh, no profundity in what it is that we need to go through to be qualified to follow Jesus. The call comes and we go and that's it, but it comes at a cost. And the cost of discipleship, though in following Jesus we gain everything, in following Jesus, we lose everything in this world. And so there's a tension there that that Bonhoeffer wants to get at. Bonhoeffer's thinking, um, and I, I want to be upfront with this, is not necessarily controversial, but often misunderstood. It has been taken by both sides of the theological spectrum. On the one hand, conservative thinkers like to think of Bonhoeffer as absolutely spot on with the way conservative theology has always spoken. In other words, uh, focused on Jesus the Christ with a, a kind of philosophical, theological uh, emphasis that takes away from earthiness. That kind of Christocentric thinking of Bonhoeffer is absolutely key to his theological insights. But on the other hand, liberal Christianity has also embraced Bonhoeffer's thinking because he talked about religionless Christianity. He was concerned always with issues of justice, of equity, of fairness, and love in the community. Um, he brought somehow these two places together in ways that had never been done before. Thinking about the centrality of Christ in every theological enterprise in the church as being significant in social justice issues. Those two things seemingly don't fit together, uh, and Bonhoeffer did it. Now, it was never systematized. It was never put together in a way that, that is satisfactory for the academic world because of what his history was, because of the tumultuous character of everything that he went through. Uh, as a young pastor, he was a noted theologian and was uh, he was able to come to the United States and actually spent some time with Paul Tillich and Reinhold Niebuhr at Union Theological Seminary in New York. He was invited to stay. He was invited to stay and come on staff, and I, I can't imagine what theological insight we would have had had he done that. But he argued and said, no, I cannot do that. Uh, I cannot betray my people. I cannot minister to my people if I'm here and they're there in the middle of that horror. And the horror he was talking about what is what was going on with the Nazi life, um, terrorizing people for the sake of their ethnicity, terrorizing people for the sake of their lack of conformity to Nazi principles and so forth. And he said, I can't do it. I'm going to minister to my people. And he went back. Now, eventually he was persuaded to participate in a plot to assassinate Hitler. He was an outspoken critic of the, um, the genocide against the Jews. He was an outspoken critic of the, the racist character of everything that went on there. He was an outspoken critic of the Third Reich generally. And for that, he was eventually persuaded to participate in a plot to assassinate Hitler. And that was so difficult for him. It was profoundly difficult for him because he was at heart a pacifist person. But in view of the profound evil that was taking place, taking place in, the, in the killing of innocent people, men, women, and children, he felt he had no choice but to participate. Now, the plot itself failed, but he was nonetheless caught and was hanged at Flossenburg Prison. Um, just literally days before it was liberated by the Allies. A sad story, but 
a story in which so many things were expressed by him that are of profound importance to us. Another book he wrote is called Letters and Papers from Prison. He wrote another book called Ethics. All of these things are uh, bits and pieces of the type of thinking that can influence us this day. He lived his faith. I spoke last time about Jürgen Moltmann, a, a, a theologian who um, really learned about God, learned about Christ in a prisoner of war camp. He was a German prisoner in an allied camp and came to understand that it was only in Christ Jesus that we have hope. Now, Bonhoeffer is learning that it is only in Christ Jesus that we recognize God in the midst of suffering. God is with us in our suffering. God and the world are reconciled in Christ Jesus. Jesus puts us together again. That which is separated by our sinfulness, by the evil of all the things going on around us, that brings us together. Even today, brothers and sisters, in the face of, of the profound polarization and terrible things that are being said in our political world, in our social world, Jesus is the center. Jesus can heal. Jesus can bring us back together. In fact, Bonhoeffer would say, and I would agree, that the only thing that will bring us meaningfully back together again is to embrace that which has happened in Christ Jesus. Bonhoeffer has been a profound influence on the life of the church ever since his death. Controversial, yes, because he had such a short life, he never got to write as much as he undoubtedly would have. But profound because he lived his faith and died because of it. That's the kind of faith that we are called upon to have, a living faith that lives out what we learn in Scripture in our day-to-day-to-day -day life. Sisters and brothers, as you seek to do that in these days, in these really controversial, difficult, confusing days where we're isolated because of a pandemic, where some are saying that, oh, we should go out and do whatever we want to do because it's part of our constitutional right. Others who are saying, no, no, we have to be sensitive to one another. Uh, there's rightness in all of these positions somehow or other, but the truth of the matter is that there is reconciliation of conflicting ideals of the evil that's in the world and the good that God expects of the world, there is reconciliation only in Jesus Christ. That was the particular insight of Bonhoeffer. We are called upon to live our faith in this world, to live our biblical faith in this world, but to recognize that that faith is going to cost us something. The world isn't happy with what God wants. The world isn't happy with an ethic of love that brings us all together. The world wants us to be at loggerheads with one another. And Bonhoeffer teaches us and wants us to understand that what's in Scripture is the centrality of Christ as the being that reconciles God and the world. Remember that and think about that as you live your life in this world, brothers and sisters. Let's bow our head in words of prayer. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for coming to this world and embracing this world and manifesting yourself to this world so that we might know your will for us. Help us to see your presence in the midst of our mess. Help us to feel your presence in the midst of the suffering that's going on in the world. And help us to see that in you there can be reconciliation, that we can come back to you, that there can be healing and there can be love and there can be joy again in this world. And as Moltmann once said, there can be hope. Grant us that grace. We thank you for the insights of theologians like Moltmann, like Niebuhr, like Tillich, like Bonhoeffer, like Bart, like any number of people who spent their lives thinking about your will for us. Help us, help us, help us to think about your will for us as well. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you um, in days to come. We invite you to our devotions on Friday and Saturday and for worship, particularly for worship on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everybody.